When the Beatles broke up in 1970, it was the end of an era. And it was such a tumultuous time with so much strife, uh, assassinations, war. And the Beatles brought a measure of freedom and so much joy into the world in the midst of all of this, but then it was over. I was a grade school kid then, and uh, I remember the feeling of their music, and I remember uh, the excitement that my older brothers would have whenever one of their uh, new albums would come out, but it was gone. But then suddenly, shortly afterwards, George Harrison came out with All Things Must Pass, a three record album, and it was a triumph filled with hope and renewal. And its most joyful song was, What is Life? Now I'll play you a short clip just to remind you of what it sounded like, uh, so I don't violate any copyright uh, laws. I'll just do a very short clip. You might remember that. Doesn't that song make you feel joyful and full of freedom? It does for me. And I think the best part of the song is its refrain. And in the refrain, it says, tell me, what is life without your love? Tell me, who am I without you by my side? Now, Israel wanted a king. They were scared. They were experiencing their version of the 1960s, filled with chaos and war and threat. They asked God to give them a king to be just like their neighbors. They were tired of being pushed around. What they thought they needed was a little bit of law and order. They wanted to feel safe again. The only thing was, and God had warned them that having a king would take away their freedom. Having a king would bring them a draft, taking, taking away their sons for war. Labor, sons and daughters would have to work in farms and factories for the king. Taxes, taking a tenth of everything. The people were asking for hierarchy, what they wanted is, is they want to be ruled over, to give up their responsibility and be told what to do. They were asking to be dominated and they would submit to that. They asked for a king to put a yoke upon them. So wait a minute. I mean, is this really the God that we know that's talking, that's telling them that they don't have to submit, they don't have to be dominated? Isn't this the, the God that we've been told all of our lives that we need to submit to? Isn't God a king? Whenever Christians get into tough spots, don't they say God is in control? Is Jesus in control? Now, Richard Rohr and other theologians have said that Jesus is the pivot of history and I like that phrase because it means that no matter whether you're a Christian or not, you could be a Muslim, you could be a Hindu, they all say that Jesus was pivotal in history because he was the purest representation of nonviolence and trust. He doesn't control at all, he just gives. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus resists the crowds because the crowds were trying to make him into a warrior king. He was repeatedly urged by them, by the devil, and even his own disciples to lead an insurrection. But he refused over and over again. His powers of healing were very apparent but he didn't use them to bring power to himself, ever. He's leading a revolution, but he's not 
building an army, which greatly disappointed those around him. Even his own family thought he was crazy and they tried to hinder him. But I think they were probably worried about his safety for good reason. Centuries of imperialism and colonialism have clouded our view of Jesus. Even Jews throughout history knew that Jesus was special, but it was the domination of the Christian church that fooled them and fooled us into thinking that, uh, in believing in a violent and dominating Jesus. Jewish leaders rejected Jesus in his time and ironically, it was when the church became obsessed with power and gained power that it was the Jews then that became the victims of the Christians. How did we get this so wrong? Well, there's a terrific book out that came out last year, um, and it's called Jesus and John Wayne by a uh, Calvin University professor uh, named Kristen uh, Cobes Dume. And you might ask, well, why is John Wayne in the title? Because in America, John Wayne represents masculinity. He's a symbol of redemptive violence. Well, redemptive violence is so built into our culture that we don't even see it. We don't even recognize that it's there, but it is, it's everywhere. Every Western, every cop show you've seen, every superhero movie, even children's shows and cartoons and books show that violence is the way to solve problems. Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings are great. I love them. But even they, in the end, use violence to get to take care of the bad guys. When you look at it this way, you can see that John Wayne is everywhere in our culture. One of the hardest parts of my seminary studies is that I've had to study and learn about many harmful expressions of Christianity, filled with domination and submission in their theology. And it breaks my heart and it makes me sad and angry. Dumais' book has so much revel uh, uh, relevance today in these theological and um, seminary circles because it carefully chronicles step by step by step how toxic Christianity has pervaded our culture and our politics since the mid to late 20th century until now. That's what the people of Israel were wanting too. And that's what they got. But that is not Jesus. It just isn't. Instead of putting his yoke on people, he shares the yoke with us, with his people. One of the most touching parts of an ordinary ordination ceremony is just to see the stole being put around the neck of the new minister. The stole is a yoke and it is a burden, a burden for sure, but it's not being laid on by a king and it's being shared with Jesus Christ. Oxen are very rarely um, yoked singly. They're usually yoked in pairs to share the burden. And in the same way, this promise uh, that Jesus has, he offers us a light burden because he walks beside us and carries the burden with us instead of lording over us. God shows himself this way time and time again in the Old Testament. Gentle, patient, and walking beside his people. So why do we constantly see him and portray him as a vengeful warrior God? We portray him as being fully in control when 
God actually gives up that control. It's not in the nature of God to be controlling and vengeful. It's our addiction to power that causes this. I think that this is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talks about in Mark. It's giving up, the, it's giving into redemptive violence and giving into domination instead of trusting in the redemption of Jesus. We have lost heart. We're tired of pain and chaos. The pandemic, the anger, the division that's going on in our society and in our world, it's exhausting us. Joyful days seem to be behind us. But 2 Corinthians says, we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For what is seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. So don't lose heart. Although it seems pretty dark now, there's an outburst of joy around the corner. Kind of like a three record album that comes suddenly on the scene. George Harrison asked in the song, what is life? Well, it's trusting in God who shares the yoke with me by my side. Let us pray. Gracious and enduring God, you walk beside us day by day. Instead of lording over us, in Jesus Christ, you share the yoke with us. Let us not give away our freedom to the hierarchy of fear and violence. Instead, help us to make the choice to trust, to trust in you, to trust that there will be an outburst of joy and freedom in you just around the corner. Open our hearts and our minds to receive that joy in your holy name. Amen.